Daniel Ling, who is a uh, consultant and an expert, a uh, practitioner of Blue Ocean strategy that we're eager to find all about. There are not a lot of qualified global practitioners of uh, Blue Ocean strategy, so she's a very unique commodity or a very unique individual, I should say. Uh, Katrina, welcome to Novus. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So Blue Ocean Strategy, just as by way of background, is a culmination of 15 plus years of research by two professors of the name uh, Kim, Kim Chen and Rene Monborn, and research on strategic moves made by 150 different <coughs> companies and, and organizations around the world, large, small, for-profit, not-for-profit. And these are, these are the, 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 the moves that created entire new markets. So it's not about competing for more market share. It's about creating new demand for entire new categories. So now how does that apply to a place like Noblis? Because some of these non-customers could translate to people you want to improve the lives of, but for some reason, they don't buy into your solution. So no matter how much research, how much money, how much effort you pump into these social innovation, public service offerings, or public policies, it's no good if there's no adoption, right? So I want to make sure you have the theoretical grounding so that you understand the concepts and that you can actually start to see the difference between maybe how you've been thinking about your projects and how you can think about your projects going forward. All right, so I expect the brain power to translate to a lot of participation, all right? <laughs> so Blue Ocean Strategy isn't just about coming up with a really compelling value proposition is aligning it with a profit proposition so that your business model is sustainable and also aligning it with a strong uh, people proposition so that the people are compelled to execute the strategy above and beyond the call of duty. What have you noticed so far? How is this different than competitive strategy? How is this different than benchmarking? Well, it focuses on broadening the market, looking at the people who are not buying your product and then figuring out why they're not buying focusing on a smaller set of users, right. looking at potential users. Right, so instead of focusing on people who already know and love you and will do whatever you tell them to do and a compromise on the, the, the solution because they're used to getting it that way, you're looking to all these people who are not already buying into your solution and, and understanding what prevents them from, from buying into your solution and how can you reconstruct so that you can offer compelling value at low cost to bring them in. Very good, yes. It also seems to be intentionally not competing head to head with market leaders. Not competing head to head with the market leaders. Or even with Nintendo Wii, they didn't have the resources to outcompete the existing uh, so other suppliers. So when you're thinking about a project, right, and you say, well, you know, we only have limited funding, and don't let that be a barrier to you choosing to do a project because the existing conditions require you to do it a certain way. Think creatively, think laterally, and see well, what you can do to reconstruct your approach so that you can do that project at lower cost. Blue Ocean Strategy not only requires you to think laterally, but also to see things that others have bypassed because of cognitive barriers. The so human brain is, is funny that way. It, 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 we've got so much, we deal with so much information on a daily basis that that's, it, it's easier to ignore new information, actually. Blue Ocean Strategy, Value Innovation, is about simultaneous pursuit of high value and low cost. And the way you do that is you eliminate, reduce things that have been taken for granted or as a result of escalation that increases your cost structure but adds no additional value to bring in more uh, people who are not already buying from your products and services. Raising factors above the industry standard because of uh, compromises that the industry has, has taken for granted, but is preventing people from adopting your, your product or solution, and creating new factors that the industry has never offered before. There is a, a systematic way, we call it the six paths, because when you study the 150 strategic moves over 120 years of business history, each one of those strategic moves broke out of one of these six boundaries. What do we mean by industry? How many of you travel between DC and New York or Boston or Philly? How do you usually get there? Shuttle, Delta shuttle. You fly. Does anyone drive? 
you drive occasionally, right? So um, Southwest Airlines, before Southwest Airlines came, came out in the 70s, uh, if you are American Airlines, you competed with United, you benchmark your meals, your check-in, everything you benchmark against the other airlines. Who did Southwest Airlines look to when they put together their service offering? Trains and cars. Why? Because people like you have a choice. And you don't always choose because of price. You could be carrying loads of luggage and it's much easier for you to drive from your driveway to the hotel in, in New York than for you to get that past security. So don't get locked into the industry. Those of you who are looking for solutions in healthcare, don't get locked in the healthcare. Those of you who are looking at solutions in transportation, don't just look to alternatives you know, within transfer. Look across. Look across to see, you know, are there alternative means, lateral thinking? Are there alternative means to achieve the same benefit? Uh, what are they trading across to? And what are the benefits that they derive from what they trade across to? Even though driving may be more tiring. Driving takes, it lo takes you longer. But what are the benefits of driving? So look to the benefits of driving, combine it with the benefits of flying, and then all of a sudden you've got Southwest. Speed of an airplane, convenience of a car, price of a tank of gas, right? So we've re reconstructed. Strategic group, Chrysler minivans, what is it a cross between? Minivans. A, a car and a van, quite simply. It drives like a car, carrying capacity of van and fits in your garage. Why? Because people notice that these, these, these families don't have enough room for the three kids and the dog and the grandma and the groceries and the ski racks, right? So they came up with the idea of combining the, the maneuver, maneuverability of a car uh, but the carrying capacity of a van. It didn't seem to address risk very much. Yep. What kind of risk are we talking about? Financial, well, implementation, well, reputation? The we, I mean, I'm sure they did some research to see how that would be accepted. But yes. Once they still went out in the market, there's yes. a risk that it would okay. have been a flop. Yeah, um, th that's a very good question. Thank you. What's your name? Robert. Robert. Thank you, Robert. Blue Ocean Strategy actually is designed to minimize risk and optimize your, maximize your return. We didn't get into the methodology of how you do this. We only dealt at the conceptual level because when you actually do this, you are going through months of market exploration with customers and non-customers, understanding what are their pain points, what is it that tr they're trading across to, how much are they paying for those uh, substitutes and alternatives, and if you reconstruct it, who would buy, who wouldn't buy. So when you actually apply Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, because of the way that it, the process takes you through, it, it actually reduces your search risk because there are six boundaries that you look across. Um, so you're not just going, you know, which way is the wind blowing today and where can I do practice my lateral thinking? You actually are going systematically across industry, across strategic group. What can I discover by going down these six paths? You're looking specifically for the three tiers of non-customers. Who's buying marginally? Who's refusing? Who are the unexplored? How can I price my product so that I can, I can get mass adoption right from the start so that I can own the category, keep the competition away from imitating uh, and uh, gain economies of scale right away from the start. So there are all these ways that when you actually apply in impl implement and it reduces your search risk, it reduces your planning risk, it reduces your scale risk, and then there are implementation principles that reduce your adopt uh, adoption risk as well. I would say on the question of risk, I think there's more risk competing in the same red ocean against the same lower margins that you're already competing and it's already crowded. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of it's counterintuitive and sort of in advising you know, our customers, uh, there's a risk of doing the same thing and, be, and competing in the same space that you right. are, which is a path to you right. know, eventually somebody losing. You know. yeah. We have trained ourselves in such a way that we are very, very good at deductive reasoning. We're in a rut. You are very, very good. We are all number crunches. We all have very good critical analytical skills. We can take a problem and break it into its components and solve it to oblivion. But what we need to do to create something that everyone else has overlooked is to be able to broaden our horizon and look laterally and think laterally 
and then diverge and then come back and converge and diverge again, come back and converge again. We don't train ourselves to look beyond the obvious. Thank you for your time.